Okay, well, hello, Donna, and hello, everyone. Um, I think we need to begin with a prayer, especially uh, today because there's a lot of technology we need to pray for <laughs> to make sure that it doesn't go wrong. So can we please all stand uh, for a, a, a commencing prayer? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Hear us, our Lord, as we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, power and glory forever and ever. Amen. Righty. Well, um, we are very excited about tonight uh, for a number of reasons. <laughs> yeah, we, I, I, know, I know Donna's in New York, but you know, that's a bit of an American thing. We don't do that in Australia a lot, Donna. We don't do the, woo, the whole woo thing. <laughs> um, so, of course, we, we're very, very excited to have Donna with us. Um, I think Justine is going to give a bit of an introduction, so I won't say too much about Donna, other than to say that I'm really excited being a Doctor Who fan that we're today going to hear from Dr. Donna. And any of you who've been watching Doctor Who will understand if you don't watch Doctor Who. I don't know, do you get that in America, Doctor Who? You know, we might. I will have to look that up. <laughs> I'm not sure. Well, there's a, there's a very important episode that includes a Dr. Donna there. Anyway, if, you, if, you, if you're really interested, we'll explain it to you later. Um, but the other reason we're really excited is that this is a really important topic. It's, such, uh, it, it's a growing issue in the Orthodox Church as it is in all communities. And uh, we don't really get to talk about it very much uh, in the Coptic Church, so this is a really exciting opportunity. Uh, we're very excited to have uh, Donna with us. Of course, we're also very excited at, at uh, some of the research and the background work that Justina and Jessica have been doing on the topic. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Justina, in whose hands, together with Jessica, uh, we are tonight. Thank you. Okay, so welcome everyone to our meeting tonight. Um, as Abuna said, and as you all know, the topic is gender and the church. Um, and as Abuna said, it's a really important topic, and it's one that I'm actually really excited that we're covering tonight, um, just because it's so relevant and it's so um, like relatable. Um, gender is like a fundamental fundamental part of our human existence. Um, it affects how we look, how we feel, how we act, how we talk. And so because it's an essential part of who we are, it also impacts how we view the world and most importantly, how we um, interact with each other as a part of the church and how we interact with God himself. So um, it's important to, of course, talk about it from the Christian Orthodox perspective and to, to tackle it and to try and understand it a bit more. Um, and it's, yeah, like we said, it's, it's a really interesting area and I've been doing a little bit of research and... Oh, I lost volume. Sorry to interrupt. You lost volume too. Yes. <laughs> okay. So I was listening to a talk and he, um, he, the speaker pointed out that there actually aren't very, very many early church writings on this topic about what it means to be a male or a female or what, like human sexuality in general. Um, they tend to sort of focus on like humanity and the humanity of Christ and how we should be as you know, people um, trying to be humans after the stature of Christ. Um, and so I think that's sort of a clear indicator of how much society has changed. Um, 2,000 years ago compared to today, where back then it wasn't really a question that needed addressing, whereas now you look around you and 
Um, the question of gender <coughs> is all over the media, it's in the politics, it's in schools, it's, it's everywhere. You go to university and they've got this whole area called gender studies. And so, yeah, like um, the church is essentially um, living or operating, I don't like using that word, but yeah, it, it's, we're in a completely different time, we're in a different context. Um, and so there are these new questions that are being posed to us that we haven't necessarily had to answer 2,000 years ago. Um, and I think it's important to point out that it's not necessarily a matter of the church having to adjust its teachings to, to address these new issues. It's more us looking back and examining our faith, examining our tradition and expressing it in a way that answers the questions that society pose to, poses to us today. Um, and St. Paul says in Galatians that there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, for we are all one in Christ. And I think that's um, an important starting point for us and it's like something that we can say with all conviction that the church teaches that we are all equal in the eyes of God and that includes um, like males and females. Um, but like it's an easy thing to say but what does it actually mean when you actually think about it? Um, what what, like, if we say that we're equal, are we male or female in any meaningful sense at all, or is it this sort of exterior layer that doesn't really matter? Um, and what are, like, the theological underpinnings of the church's understanding of gender? Um, and I suppose as well the question of what role does gender play, practically speaking, in the life of the church? So there's lots of, yeah, lots of questions that we need answering, um, and I'm glad that I don't have to answer them, and we've got Donna here with us. Um, and as Avuna said, um, we're really thankful that Donna has been able to join us today and help shed a little bit of light on this important topic. Um, Donna is an adjunct professor of theology at St. Peter's University in New York um, and serves in the Coptic Diocese of New York and New England as a theological educator. Um, and if you do a quick Google search and look for Learn, Pray, Love, Donna's got um, this really cool blog that I really encourage you to have a look at, which covers a lot of um, different um, issues, particularly um, some sort of related to what we're talking about tonight, about purity laws and um, the churching of women and things like that, that are all really important um, issues in our church today. So I'd encourage you to have a look if you can. Um, as you can also see, we're trying something a little bit different with Donna uh, dialing in through Skype. And again, we're really thankful. Um, I can't imagine it's an easy thing to wake up at 4 a.m. and open your computer and deliver a lecture to 50 or 100 people on the other side of the world, so thank you. Um, and a few housekeeping things. Um, this topic is really, really broad, and in doing like the research and trying to figure out what areas we wanted to look at, we've tried to sort of narrow the scope as much as we could and just focus tonight on building some foundations and building sort of like um, a common starting point. So we're not necessarily going to look to answer any specific sort of big controversial questions today. It's going to be more a matter of, um, yeah, just establishing a starting point for further discussion. And if, you know, we can, we always talk for hours after the meeting or go on the Facebook page and post any questions if you've got any. Um, yeah, and yeah, with no further ado, um, pass you on to Donna's capable hands. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, I have never done a Skype lecture, so <laughs> um, I'm praying in like a visit that y'all pray everything goes well. Um, you see my PowerPoint is clear and my voice is clear? Okay. So I actually hear my voice, so I'm going to try to ignore my own voice in my echo. So best I can. So we're talking about uh, church and gender, and like you said, it's a very broad topic. Um, the topic that we also need to be discussing, uh, when I said it as well, and it's sort of an interesting sort of topic. It's among not only the Orthodox, but the one else as well. And like you said, we want to just build foundation. We're not going to be able to get the rest. Nor is that sort of our goal. We think our goal here now is to understand our perspective is what we are living in the 20th century, what is relevant to my faith, my living in an faithful age, and how do I still apply teaching the early church 
in a world that's constantly changing, a world that's very demanding, a world that's forming us rather than us forming them, unfortunately, sometimes as well. So I hope, again, we'll build the foundations of our perspective and it will um, church, and we'll see where sort of discussions go. Um, if there's anything, any clarification that needs happening, we have a discussion after the lecture. It is, um, for lack of a better word, sort of a sensitive topic. I don't want to use that word, but I will for now. Um, this sense that sometimes, because we're not exposed to uh, these things healthily in the church, I should say, uh, we, some of us like to oppose it, or we become discomforted, uh, and we tend to shy away from such discussions. And I think it's such a healthy um, meaning point that we're here today to discuss these things. Not for the sake of controversy, not for the sake of causing disruption in the church, that's not the goal. Um, but our goal is not to deform, but to inform. And I think as uh, Christians today, especially now in the West, where knowledge and access is very accessible for us in every aspect, that we could be easily led astray in different perspectives. And so it's our duty as baptized Christians to understand who we are as our identity, um, as our, for our doctrine, and for our living dynamic. So when we talk about church and gender, there's a few things that we have to ask ourselves. Does gender exist in the church? Should it exist? Does it even matter? And so as the famous quote as Christina mentioned, that you know, sometimes we say there's no male or female in the church. And one question we have to keep in mind, and hopefully this will be answered today, how does again the church respond to this concept of gender? So, first of all, I always like to go back to our understanding of who God is. Because our fundamental understanding of who we are as a human being always relates back to the maker, creator, our source, our life giver. So in our Orthodox faith, we always say that we know who God is as a father, as a creator, but we don't necessarily know what he is, his essence, his nature. And what we say as Orthodox Christians, especially if you look at the liturgy of St. Gregory, theologian, we express God in what we call apostatic language. So in sort of a negative way. So he's unlimited, he's uncontainable, he's mortal, he's infinite, without beginning, without end, and so forth. And timeless. So all these things that we cannot define God, we to define him in what he is not. Right? He's unlimited, infinite, and all these things. So St. Gregory also says, it is difficult to conceive God, but to define him in words is an impossibility. And so we use the language that we've been giving, and according to scripture, according to the teachings of the fathers and everything, to understand who God is. Why? Because in understanding who he is, we understand our humanity and my source of being, my source of existence. And many fathers talk about knowing myself, and in knowing myself, I'll know God. In knowing God, I'll also know myself. So there's kind of this, there is this connection between myself and the Creator, because He is my source, He is my starting point. And we know that God, being the Christian God that we know, is Trinity, unity and diversity, three in one. And at the same time, if we look at the Christian apologists and the way they define God, they never defined him according to gender. We never hear that God is male or female. And I don't want to go into sort of the, the biblical language that sometimes contested in feministic movements today that they want to change the language that God is a she and so forth. But this is what we perceived and this is what we understand, that God is genderless. He is above gender because we know that he is divine by nature. We don't know what that is. We know that who he is as a father as a comforter and as a redeemer and all these things. But we don't limit him according to gender. And if we limit him to gender, then we degrade him to human understanding and to human pattern. But he, of course, as we know, he's above human creation, all these things. And so then you say, then how do we understand our humanity if God is genderless? So in understanding 
our humanity, I always like to go back to the beginning, the creation story. So many of us know the creation story, of course. There's, some scholars say there's two stories, but there's two accounts that we know. Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27, and Genesis from chapter 2. I'll read them both. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the sea, over the air, and so forth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female, and he created him. And the Lord God formed man of dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. In this latter verse is from chapter 2. And so we know the story when Eve, uh, when Eve is eventually formed from Adam, later on in the chapter. And the scripture says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused the deeps to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken to man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken to man. And so this is our fundamental understanding of who we are as a human being. In my understanding of my creation, I understand my creator and my soul. So this, of course, is the first time we know of the distinction between male and female. And, of course, as we know from the beginning, they are made uh, in equality, equal in nature, equal in essence, and they share the same humanity. So he created them male and female, and he created them equal. And even in this understanding of what it means to be human, there's a complexity, because at the same time we're made from the the creation, the matter, but we also have the divine image, right, of the Trinity. Let us make man in our image and our likeness. And so humanity has this dual complexity and this mystery of being made in this image, divine creator, but also made in matter. And someone might ask, if God does not have, have gender, how does gender come about? How does it come to be? I don't have a complete answer, but what I'll say from my perspective is that this is part of the mystery of the human being. Something that we, I think, as human beings, there's some aspect we will not fully understand, even about humanity. And regardless whether we understand what male and female in that sense is, we know that God has created both equally, both according to the same nature, and both in his image. And so, then we know, of course, the story of um, sorry. the fall. And the issue comes now with our understanding of after the fall. You know, we have these sort of discussions, I think they're aimless discussions, to be honest, of who was at fault more, who sinned more, was Eve more at fault, is, is it the woman's fault, is it the man's fault greater because he listened to the woman and so forth. And we end up in these and these aimless discussions, and we go around, and then it creates more of a gender gap and discrimination of who to blame, as it was from the beginning, as Adam blamed the Eve, and Adam blamed God, and Adam blamed the servant, and so forth. And so then the, the question we should be asking is, even after the fall, are they still equal? And even after the fall, how do we perceive gender? Because we know gender existed before the fall. So we know God had an intention create this diversity, this unity and diversity, even in humanity, that are both still made in his image and his likeness. So if we're still made in his image and like this, there's unity and diversity. There's a distinction, but there's no inequality. And so, of course, we know that there's the curse in chapter 3 and so forth. Both receive the curse, both fall, and both are under the, the law of death and law of sin. So whether we have those discussions of uh, you know, I've, I've read before in a blog that someone said, oh, Eve sinned, make kind of like a tally marks, Eve sinned two or three times, and Adam sinned twice. And I thought to myself, there is no point of going to this sort of numerical account of who sinned more. Because in that aspect, again, we're trying to create who is to blame more, the woman or the man. 
And if we still have these kind of cultural and societal distinctions in our mind and in the way we perceive things, even from a biblical perspective, we're still indoctrinating ourselves this sort of gender gap that God constantly is bringing us together and from the beginning brought us together in his image. But it's uh, us who want to sort of divide that, separate that, and, and judge and discriminate and so forth, and devalue and all these other things that we constantly do, whether subconsciously or consciously. And so from our perspective, of course, now that we have, we are in the time of grace, as we say, now that after the fall, we have received the grace of Christ coming in the flesh for the sake of all of humanity. And as Orthodox Christians, we believe, of course, that we're restored and we're redeemed in the water of that baptism. And so if I believe that in the beginning, God created us as male and female, unity and diversity, and equal, and sharing in the same value, sharing the same humanity, and sharing the same image of the Trinity. Likewise, in Christ, I also believe that in the Trinity, he also restores me back to that same image, that same likeness that we shared in the beginning with the fall. Because everything that Christ took, he saved in himself, as we know. And in the church, we also receive that gift in him. And so in the waters of baptism, male or female, we all receive this redemption, this restoration. And we all put on the same man, which is Christ, male or female. And there's no discrimination. And this is why, again, I'll probably be repeating this verse over and over. But in the church, in Christ, there's no male. And it's not that our gender, our unique identity that was made by the Creator is dissolved in the church miraculously. By the snap of the fingers, we're baptized, we have no gender. No, this is not what the church teaches, and this is not what St. Paul insinuates. It's the idea that there's no more discrimination, there's no more separation. There's no more judgment. There's no more inequality as the way that society or culture or even ourselves have put upon ourselves to separate us from each other. And unfortunately, this, whether society, whether any of influences, we bring them into the church because we are the church, of course. But we bring those teachings, we bring those experiences, we bring those wrong um, the theological perspective into the faith. And this is where we have a problem. And this is why we say, oh, there is gender in the church because the women feel like this, or the man says this, or the separation we sit, or men go before women, or this happens. And so because of our experiences, because we allow society to drive us rather than the doctrine of the church to drive us, the teachings of Christ to drive us, that we still feel that there is discrimination in the church. But this reality, this sort of utopian expression by St. Paul, there's no male and female, it's ideal and doesn't exist. And it doesn't apply because it's theoretical. And so we sort of discard the church that it's sexist or, it's, or the women in the church who have voices that are feminist or, or it's clerical or all these things we'd like to label in the church without understanding what the church was meant to be and what the church should be in Christ. And everything that we do has to mimic this ideal. As much as we say all these ideals in Scripture, you know, that, that I always say that Scripture is, the Gospel of Christ is very simple, but the most difficult, narrow way, all these things, to be perfect. But by the grace of the Holy Spirit that we believe is present in the Church from the beginning, that the Holy Spirit is continuing to live and breathe in the members of the Church to be this ideal that we have to be. And it's up to us as living members, as baptized members, to live that ideal. And it's also up to us to, to keep that division. So it's not that, the, that God is leaving this kind of suppression upon the church, upon this discrimination of male and female, but it's God's desire to have this no male and female, because all are saved in the same Christ. All are saved in the same redemption that he took all of humanity in himself when he was in him, when he became church. And so God respects my personhood. Do I respect my personhood? Do I respect the personhood of the other in the body as male and female? Do we respect each other 
in the diversity of our gender within the walls of the church and outside the walls of the church. Where does gender exist in my life and how do I perceive it? And so if we look at society, because society, we are people in the world, of course we're not called the other world, as we say, right? the ideal again, but however we're living in the, in the world of society and we, we are brought in a certain culture, whether we're brought up in the West or in the East or what have you, we all are raised with certain views of gender. And sometimes we allow those gender views and perspectives to drive how I view church as well and vice versa. And so if we look at society's views, we have a lot of labels now, at least in the 21st century, of gender. And if you look at society, there are so many different meanings of what gender is. But our worldview as Orthodox Christians is not based according to the worldview, ironically as that sounds, but it's based on the revelation, the theological truth manifested through Christ, manifested through the Trinity, the Church. So how we view the world, how we engage the world, is how God engages us and how God shows us how to engage with the world. Because we always say, oh, the world is evil, the world is come. But at the end of the day, the world is part of the creation. And the world is part of our life and we're called to be, to engage, and to lead and to be a light in the world. We're not supposed to be dictated by what society tells us. And so with gender, this becomes very problematic, I would say, because things are happening so quickly now in our time. And with social media, influence and change, and, and this idea, I don't know so much about Australian culture, especially in I would say, is the, one of the sort of underlying cultural foundations, if you may say, of American culture, is to be, be free, be expressive, be who you want to be. Regardless, there's no limit to what that is. And so to the point that now, I think this was about a year or two ago, if I'm not mistaken. Um, there was even the question of the gender that uh, we should have shared bathrooms you know, in high school or for younger children. Because you know, if I feel like if I'm a male, I'm raised as a male, but I feel like I'm actually called to be a woman, transgender, what have you, I should have the right to go and use that third bathroom. I shouldn't have this gender discrimination, so to speak. So it's coming to that point that there's no limits. And there's sort of a blurring of our understanding of that distinction. And not inequality, it's, it's blurring of mixing up what inequality and distinction. Distinction doesn't mean inequality. And so again, our social construct and our social perspective has to be from a theological perspective firsthand. Because we are defined by God and we're not defined by the fellow person. We cannot allow, as easy as it is, but society and culture to define what gender is or how we view our gender. We might be, have these cultural influences of what, uh, for a man and woman and so forth, but what is gender? What is part of my humanity? How was I created? Regardless of how my cultural identity may be is. And so I think that this is a, an identity crisis. And again, so it's a social construct versus divine. Who am I versus who am I called to be? And so if you, I don't know if Kardashians are famous in Australia, I hate to mention this, but I will have to for a sake of an example. Um, about, I think about a year or two ago, the, I forgot his name, I think it was, he was Bruce Jenner, his famous um, athlete. Now the whole, there was that movement where he, Right, he had a um, operation to change himself, and now he calls himself Caitlyn. So even in that statement, that now there's an identity crisis, right? So that that he felt, and not only him, I'm not trying to point him only, but there's that movement that I feel I should be a woman, although I was made in my humanity a male, whatever that means. So I'm going to do this, and I'm going to manipulate my humanity according to science. I'm going to manipulate my humanity according to culture, or what culture says. 
And at the core of that, in my opinion, I believe that this is an identity crisis. We don't know who we are as human beings. And the only way we'll know who we are as human beings is knowing Christ. And this is what I said from the beginning, that we don't need to know who God is to know ourselves and vice versa. Because if we don't know who he is, we don't know who ourselves are. We don't know how we were made in his image and his life. And if I am confident in my creation, in my restoration and baptism, then the likeliness of an identity crisis is very slim to nothing. Again, we all have challenges of who we are and all those big life questions. But if I know and I know my source and I begin to know my creator, and in that process of living in the life of the church, the church that is teaching us to be formed and baptized and molded into Christ, that I'm formed into him, who, who shows me and who restores me to the real image of humanity in Christ, then I won't have an identity crisis because my identity isn't only him. And this is why St. Pope constantly uses the language in Christ, be like Christ, to be formed in Christ, to be made in the image of Christ. It's not that we lose again our humanity in Christ. We become more human in him. And likewise, gender. We don't lose our gender once we walk through the doors of the church. We become more of who we are within the church. Because it is in the church we're formed. It is the church we're restored. It is the church that we're redeemed. And so again, it's the church who needs to guide and it's the church, the ideal church, like I said, what God has ordained, instead of the world shaping us. I thought this was very interesting. I don't know if anyone saw this. Um, so I went on Facebook a few years ago. Well, I'm on Facebook obviously regularly, but this is, I forgot what I was doing. But not that I was changing my gender, but I saw this. Um, and I was just, I was floored to say the least. And I, I, I just couldn't understand. I don't even, I don't even know what half the terms are. So female, female, male, trans female, transgender, transsexual, all these terms. And I was just, I was just shocked that, but I just love it. And, but this is just kind of an emblem of how our society is thinking, that there's no limits that there's no distinction. Distinction means discrimination. Distinction means inequality. Distinction means less than. It's not, this is not how we were taught. This is not what we believe. We also think this distinction is discrimination. We say, well, there's distinction is trinity. Then we say the trinity, there's inequality. But of course, this is not so what we believe. So even in the distinction, there's unity and diversity. And likewise, in, in the creation, there's unity and diversity and equality. And so this muddling of perspectives of male and female and male to female and female to male and trans, all these other things we want to cover up because we're trying to, I believe, as a society, as a people, as a humanity, we're trying to understand who we are without going to the source. And so that's why you're, you're always going to be confused and you're going to have all these questions and all these muddling of labels without understanding going back to the source, source of the creation, source of my source, um, being made in his image. And so my call as a living, baptized member of the body of the church, as male or female, we're not called by any label, but other than Christ himself. And in the church, like we've said, is not a social contract, it's a divine contract. And again, if it is not, if the church is not built and established on this image, divine construct, this divine image of the Trinity in which we were made from the beginning, it likewise has failed to become what church is. And I'll clarify what that means. In the sense of how we view, some of us may view, oh, the church is, you know, we have these uh, sort of expressions of the church is, we're in, we're in the struggling church, the church is, we're in the hospital, all these, these are, these are fine examples. But what we want to focus on is, like I said from the beginning, the ideal. What is the ideal that God is showing what church is? But the church is the body of Christ, and Christ in his humanity is perfect. This is the this is the 
the standard. And of course, we fall in support of that. But whether we want to aim to it or not, this is the reality. The reality is a divine construct. And the reality is there's no male or female. There's no gender discrimination. Whether we bring that discrimination in the church as a people, the reality of God's church, there is no discrimination. There is no separation. There's a distinction. There's equality. There's a sharing of humanity. There's a respect for each person. There's no hierarchy in the sense of one is above the other. We're all made equal, lay or clergy, in the image of the Trinity. And even in the book of Revelation, and in the book of, uh, I think, First Peter, the language that's also used as, as far as us being baptized is that we're consecrated, we're ordained. So even the lay person is ordained. Saying, oh, Donna's saying everyone's been ordained. No. In the sense that we're all consecrated, we're separated, and we're set apart in the Lord. Ordination means consecration. And we're all consecrated by the Myrun, right? We're consecrated and we're graced with the Holy Spirit. So in that sense, male or female, we're all ordained in the body of Christ. We all have a function that St. Peter says it's a royal priesthood, to have a royal priesthood from the Lord. And if we understand that, and that grace, and that gift in the church, most likely will lessen our questions and our frustrations of why the church has such discriminations or why the church is led by males, or why the church does not have role for females, and so forth. Because we fail, those questions we fail, sadly, I should say, or we've fallen short, we're progressive from here, by the grace of Christ. We fail to achieve that ideal that there is no male and female church in Christ. And within that, like I said, we do not lose our gender. We don't lose our personhood within the church. There's that distinction. God honors our gender. God honors our humanity. If not, then that would reflect on who he is if he doesn't honor himself and his creation. And so in the beauty of the creation of humanity, there's that unity and diversity. And the church also, St. Paul talks about the image of the church um, as marriage. Right. And the unity, again, of male and female. And each person has a role. Again, not one higher than the other that we also sometimes perceive in, in marriage. But they each have a different role, whatever that role may be. But they're equal, always sharing in the same divine gifts. And so, of course, the golden question is, what is the role of each person within the church? As we said earlier, I think that one hour will not suffice to answer such question. But I always believe that we go back to what is my role as a human being? What is my role to fulfill my right of creation? What is my role of being human in the society, in the church, as a Christian? And the only way, again, the, the ideal, the standard to be human is to be like Christ, because he is the ideal, he is the perfect one. So these are ideals, these are utopian theories. But again, if we don't believe in that standard, then we're constantly going to be lowering the bar for ourselves. And we're constantly going to be putting ourselves lower. And we're constantly going to be filling and trying to force that gap without building up the progression towards what God has called us each to be, and each member. Because even if one or two members within the church, within the body, is fighting for this ideal, it's not enough. It, everyone has to be progressing. Everyone is carrying the body with each other. And this is we affect each one of them. Oftentimes, I always say this as well, especially in American society, it's mostly in the West, in my opinion, spreading work. We're in a very individualistic stage of how we perceive life and society always. And this is so detrimental to how we view church. Because it's all about me and my goals and my success and my life and me and all about my life. And I don't realize my effect towards the people around me, towards my family, to the people I interact with, so forth. And so we bring that individuality within the walls of the church. And this is problematic because this is exactly the opposite of church. Church is the body. It is not one person. One Christian is no Christian, 
It is the body coming together, united together. And so if I believe I'm an individual, I've lost my understanding of person. Because if I'm made as a person in the Trinity, Trinity persons of communion, then I also lost his understanding that I myself will not affect the body. So if I have, if I say, oh, I have sexist views, or I have racial views, but I don't affect anyone. These are my views. It's not going to affect anyone. We're fooling ourselves. Because we as humans affect each other. We impose our views and vice versa. And so we as a body need to understand that we all together are progressively trying to attain this goal together as a church. And this is why we gather together as a church. We don't have, even in the Eucharist, the canons of the church say, not one person can pray the liturgy. There has to be at least three. The idea is because it's the church. It has to be a group of people together. Another thing that we do, again, in liturgy is an emblem of, again, the idea of the body together. The kiss of peace. Oh, you know, this is nice. But there's, a, there's an idea behind that that we all, my sin affects your sin. My righteousness affects your righteousness. And so if we come with this idea that whatever I believe and whatever I have set my standard to, I will affect the rest of the church. This has to become our reality, and this is the truth. And so even if I have these views on gender, healthy or unhealthy, I am affecting the church in a negative or positive way. And so, of course, the ideal is that every member of the church, every baptized member is filling that calling of their right of creation to be that perfect image, to be that equal, shared human nature made in this image of the tree, male and female. And so if we go back to the role of each person in the church, sometimes we feel that gender, maybe sometimes women feel this, maybe, I'm saying, that gender is a hindrance in fulfilling my role in the church. And so, of course, you know, the typical questions that, you know, women may ask, I want to be more active in the church. Why can't we be priests? And I think that's always the default question for many people. And so we always fall short again because we feel that there is a male dominant aspect of the church, or there's a gender gap, I should say, maybe, or that certain roles are only for this certain gender. And so there's a a feeling of discrimination, a less than. And so then I feel, as maybe as a woman, as a Orthodox woman, that I cannot fill my function in the church because the church is not allowing me to flourish. Society might allow me to flourish because now society is teaching, you know, having these movements and equality and so forth, but I feel like my church is. And this is, I think this is the most sad state that we face. Society is better than the church. That the society is more free than the church. There's an issue. And whatever that issue may be at the end of the day, but again, this reality that there's no male or female, we all, all have to reach this understanding of, this, of the reality and the truth. That there's no gender and inequality in God, then this has to be actualized in the church. There's a prayer in the first hour of the Isaiah yeah, that we say. Um, from Ephesians 4. And it says, Walk worthy of the calling with which you are in the unity of the Spirit, in one Lord, in one faith, in one baptism. And each one grace was given according to the measure of Christ. And so if we say, male or female, that our gender is a hindrance to my role in the church, and I'm talking again about the ideal of the church, God has called it. Then, when we say this, and we reflect on God and saying that God has created me in an unjust way. God has created the church in a misogynistic way. Or God has created this and this and this. And so then there's a problem. Then we reflect again, then who is God? Is he the ultimate good creator? Is he ultimately created male and female equally? What do we believe about him? And what do we believe about ourselves? But if we believe, obviously, in scripture, as I hope we all do, of course, that the reality is that we're made equally in the image of the Trinity, this reality has to come in practice. And of course, these are, you know, we might think to ourselves, oh, these are nice ideals, this is not going to happen, and so forth. But if it begins with us as our group today, or it begins with a change 
like I said, we're not here to reform, to inform, because this is a fundamental aspect of our Christian faith. And that I know that my gender is part of my humanity. And if God has made me equal in his image, male and female, and if I believe as a baptized Orthodox Christian member that I am consecrated, and set apart, I am ordained, that I receive the grace of the Holy Spirit. By right and by definition, I have received a gift. And by definition, I have a charisma, hope, charisma, a gift, um, a choice, uh, not choice, sorry, a call in the church, then I know whether male or female, I have a calling in this body. And again, as real truth, we can find this calling. Again, like I said, this role, what this call is, this is for each person to discover through the guidance of the church, through the guidance of your spiritual mentors, your spiritual directors, that we we find what is our role. Because we like to dichotomize often. We like to take things like labels that like I said. My role is a deacon. My role is a high school teacher. And while these are easy things to fit into because, you know, they're clear-cut roles that we have in the church today. And this is why, obviously, the, the, the question of priesthood always happens because it's a clear role, right? But if I am in touch with my humanity, and if I'm in touch with my creator and in the life of the church, and I am ardently seeking what is my role, what is my gift I've been given, if God has ordained me and has chosen me and given me this gift, then I have this gift and I have this responsibility to find calling on my part. I would like to compare it to, you know, as we be in high school and we go through college and all these adult life decisions, we somehow find our career choice. We somehow find what we want to do for the rest of our lives. We somehow find our life partner or our calling in whatever aspect it might be, right? Whether we succeed, whatever success might be in our eyes, in whatever career path we might take, and of course that's influenced probably by many things, you know, by culture, by society, all the things. But if we feel that we are in a career path that we love, or we come to this discovery of what have how much more should it be real and a reality within the church? But when it comes to the church, it's just, it, we, we come into despair because we feel that it should be handed down to us. Well, to a certain extent, it is true, but we also have a responsibility. And we have a calling that we can fulfill and a calling that we're to be called. And so even in society teaching us, we have to pursue and we have to seek and we have to research. We have to understand. We have to experience. We have to know exactly what we want for a short period of our life. Short or long, if you want to say career. But in the role of my personhood and the role of the gift, the charisma that I've given according to the Spirit, we, we fall short of it sometimes. And you might say, oh, well, the church doesn't teach us, the church doesn't direct us. It is also up to us to make that reality true. We have to have that responsibility with the guidances, as I said, with our spiritual father, with prayers, with that desire to seek it at the end of the day. I think sometimes... Maybe we would want to come our experience or our pain or our frustration with what have we, what we have within the church or society, and we come to attack rather to find a solution. So we, we want to come to attack saying, why doesn't the church do this? Why doesn't the church do that? And so we put the church in a corner rather than putting ourselves in a corner saying, what am I doing to fulfill that call with which I was called? What is that calling? I can't sit here and say, well, this person then you have this gift of And while once we get to know ourselves and get each other, we might discover this. And God revealed because He's me. And so many people come to me and say, Don, I don't feel as a woman especially. I don't feel I'm called to Sunday school. Who told you Sunday school is the only thing to do? And I know because, again, that's a clear role that we have, right? There are many diverse gifts. Holy Spirit gives for the edification of the church. And so, of course, we know this name is. Go, I'll skip that. Oh, there it is. And so, we know the, the, verse, the chapter on the diversity of gifts. And he says, 
God had to put the bees in the church. First apostle, second prophet, third teacher. After that, there are gifts of healing, help, administration, guiding the people. Are all apostles, all prophets, all teachers, are all workers, miracles, and so forth. And so, even scriptures come teaching her that the spirit is a spirit of mercy and unity. And so, this concept of conformity, concept of that the only role that exists in the church today is the clergy and possibly Sunday school, that we're again cornered and we're, I believe, that we're not giving God the credit and what is due to the diversity of gifts he's given to And like I said, it's up to us. And if we are faithful, God will be faithful. And God is faithful. He will reveal what this role is. So we have a role in art or music or administration or management. All these gifts that even even in our careers that we can flourish, we could also bring those talents in the church in whatever capacity there is. As I know this might be, again, ideal or easy, but again, I believe that if we are faithful and we take this seriously, God will reveal and He will show the way of action with the church. I want to go back to something I just skipped, actually. Um, and this is what something Justine actually, Justina mentioned briefly, that when we talk about Christ again, you know, the question is, some people think, oh, Christ was male, and even if that, that sexist, and God is always is in male, and to church is sex, all these things, again, there's, we go with an attack, there's always an attack, rather than an understanding. And so, obviously, in our Christian faith, we look at Christ as human. We don't define Christ as male. While he is male, of course, we say that, as his gender. But in understanding our redemption and our salvation, we say, and Christ became man. Christ became human. Christ took flesh. Just like Christ took maleness. Or Christ took gender. While that still he was male by gender. But in the understanding for our salvation, the truth, that he became human for everyone. Because if we even use that language already, we're labeling Christ, we're limiting him to gender, diminishing him to just a genderly function rather than a redemptive uh, function in the way that we understand him as a redeemer. And so, of course, in the creed, we don't say we believe in one for Jesus Christ who became male. Of course, we say he became man, man before God. And because, in this sense, again, then we would believe that Christ, of course, came just to save a male, men. And salvation is limited to just men. And so, as well, even if you look at the Father, as much as, of course, it was a different time and different culture, they rarely, almost never speak about Christ male. Unless they sometimes kind of, uh, with the allegory of the Old Testament, as the lamb, as the male. But even in speaking about Christ, the language that is used, doctrine that is expressed, is Christ became an effect. It's not about a gender discrimination. It's about him being human. And so again, this is why in the church, it's us being human. It's not about being defined by gender. It's part of who we are, yes. But we're not defined by it. We're not limited to it. There is a story, um, some of you may know her, uh, Metropolitan Police is where um, he came to he came to the open conference about a year ago. And he was telling us a story that he was in Oxford. He was a professor at Oxford many years. And one of his students came to me and said, um, I want to do research. I want to do my master's thesis on how the fathers viewed the maleness of Christ. And so he said, okay, this is interesting. This has never been done before. So it's something on earth. He said, you could, you could go ahead and pursue that topic. He said, I'm afraid the thesis will be very, very short. Because the father never spoke about the maleness of Christ. And so the idea, and he laughed it off, and said, because, again, that they focused on the humanity. And so even sometimes in our brains, even the way students, not one of them, 
But sometimes the way, again, society and cultural, we want to limit ourselves to gender. And so even the way I see my personhood in my role in the church, I want to limit myself to my gender. And this is why, again, that question always comes for women. Why cannot women be priests? Not every male is able to be priest. So what do the males do? What do the men do? What is their, what is their function? And so even in the women's ministry that we're starting up here in New York, I tell the women's group that in understanding the woman's role in the church, we will also help, I believe, help realize the role of the male. Because we're complementary, unity and diverse. We affect each other, vice versa. And so not everyone is called to be a teacher. Not everyone is called to be a priest. So what is our calling with which we are? So one of the quotes from St. Gregory, is a, one of his operations, he says, Christ saves both by his passion. Was he made flesh for the man? He was also for the woman. Did he die for the man? The woman is also saved by his death. He is called of the seed of David, and so perhaps you think the man is here. He's born of a virgin, and this is on the woman's side. Thus he says, thus the two he says, shall be one flesh, so let the one flesh have equal one. Sometimes we, we read the Father, this is my tangent for me, and we think the Father did also that. Of course, everything comes in its time and place. But if we look at, again, the teaching, the doctrine of the Father, it's always about the equality and the unity and diversity of the creation. Because again, if we disparage and discriminate male and female, this also gets reflected in how we do God. If we discriminate in his creation, then what does that make God? God is unjust, and he's, and he's also discriminating. Because if we are made in his image, whatever we reflect will be reflected us according to what we understand of that and so I say if we believe or even if we act if we act if we act if we act there has to be a belief there has to be a marrying of belief and a practice if we believe or even if we act we're treating males and females differently according to the right of creation according to Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 in and outside the church this is my opinion. It is as grave as saying the spirit is not equal with the son or is the father. This is the of Arianism, for example, for humanity. Because we're made in the image of the Trinity. And this reflects the equality of human nature among themselves as the Trinity, divine persons who are equal among themselves. So again, if I treat male to female, treat or believe that they are that reflects my belief on who God is as a creator, as three persons, trinity and diversity. Because again, my right of creation is being made equal and being made human, sharing in the same humanity, male and female. And then if you look at Christ, this is why some people say Christ was such a radical teacher. And it's phenomenal if you look at the life of Christ and how he dealt with culture and taboos and society. And one of one of our youth leaders, actually from Astro Besson, would say to us that if Christ here today and he did what he did with culture and taboos and all those things, many of our parents would say, Don't hang out with that guy. That, that guy's crazy. And so I thought that that was that was true in some way. But when you look at the life of Christ, he constantly debunked these cultural divisions and this, these society oppressions that we have, especially on women and men in society and in the church, in, in the faith and in the practice. And so the way he dealt with the Jew and the Greek and the female and the prostitute and the Samaritan woman and Mary Magdalene, all these images, and all these people, all these diverse people, and how he dealt with them. And he raised them, and he elevated them, and he honored them, and he valued them. And it's phenomenal, especially if you want to say in first century Judaism, and how he dealt with that, and he destroyed cultural taboos, is phenomenal. And so if we say the truth, 
is not, is this, that we're not fulfilling again what Christ did, that he came to destroy those divisions. Again, this is why there's no male or female in the church. There's no division. I heard also recently that, I mean, many of you heard this as well, even in, you know, I know we say this a lot during the resurrection, a woman, you know, have Christ, of course, and then appears as a woman first, and honoring them and witnessing them. And for a woman to go and to give a witness at that time, a woman's witness was never uh, valued or had any recognition according to the law. And But he knew that, of course, and so he honored women. And so again, in Christ appearing to the woman, and in Christ doing all the things that he did in his life, he's destroying gender gap, destroying the gender gaps that we've created after the fall in all the things that society and we as a people have created. And we have led astray according to, again, doctrine of creation, doctrine of being made in that image and that life. And unfortunately, I know we might joke it off and sort of roll rise, but even within the church, I think this is one point that it's always clear that way we discriminate is if you look at their ceremony, you know, many of us, our favorite part at the end, of course, where, you know, when the priest or the celebrant is giving the instructions to the bride and the groom, and of course everyone's on edge and waiting, the bride's response gives her the instructions of course. And then you, you know, you have the, the, the snickers, you have the giggle, you have all whatever you would pray. But even in those comments, as quote, unquote, innocent as they might be, right, the instructions of the church for the male and female, it shows again how we view a woman, how we view a man, and how we view marriage and their rules. And on many levels, I don't want to go off on that tangent, but that's just one small example of how, again, our gender gap is, is there, and it's very real. And we keep it real, and we keep it real and alive in our comments. And, and we like to twist things, even within the church prayers, according to what I believe is, uh, is unequal or to support my argument of the male should be the, 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 and the woman should be the, 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 whatever that might be. The woman should never have his presence. And so we like to twist things. And in twisting those things again, we are at loss. And in twisting those things, we reflect a bad theology in the world of the church. And then at the end, we blame the church. But again, at the end, it's how we perceive what the church is, with how we understand it, and what we bring to that. Which again, is our false understanding of what church is. False to be like. And I believe one thing that we, especially when we talk about gender and male people, that my role in the church, ultimately, my calling, whether male or female, will restore my idea of what is gender, will restore my idea of is my humanity, the ministry, of what that is. And it will also restore our idea of what is the church, us. And in that sense, I even say, we have, I think we have a problem to a certain extent. That especially, not only the Orthodox Church, but other churches, that we have this, what we call clericism. And of course, clericism has to do with gender, because of course, clericism is, clergy is really restricted to males, at least in the Orthodox and Catholic churches. And because of this, this problem of clericism, what is clericism? That this idea that the main role and the higher, I would say, value or how we perceive it in the church is the clergy. And it's sort of this kind of underlying thought or teaching, belief or what have you, of that clericism is belief that they're the acquisition of the Holy Spirit belongs to the clergy. I am not saying that they are not ordained and they are not chosen. I am not saying that they do not have the Holy Spirit. Of course they are ordained and they receive the grace of the priest in the sacrament. But what I'm saying is if we fall into this idea of clericism, that the only role exists and the only real ideal function of the Holy Spirit exists only in clergy, we're again losing our identity 
we're losing our function as a church holistically and we're losing our function of my role according to what I've been given back. So again, of course, this is easy to say for women because if I'm not called to be priest, of course, then what is my function? Does the Holy Spirit exist among the lake? The church is, what, 98% if you want to give a number of lay people. So then if the Holy Spirit is predominant among the clergy, then what is the role of the people? This is why we feel we're, we're bystanders, we're passive. And again, this is why many times the role, the question is, why women do not be priests? The, the problem is with the question and the idea and the belief that everything is done by the priest. I always joke, I don't know again how it is in Australia, um, but I believe, again, these are my personal observations, that in that understanding of clericism, that we put so much emphasis on the priest. The priest's role is to teach and to guide and to instruct, to be followed. Yes, this is role. But if we say the only role in the church is the priest, we've lost the Christian spirit. We've lost what St. Paul has said, the diversity of gift. And again, we are bringing it back to God, saying that you have to give the ordination, the consecration to us in baptism. So we're putting it back on him. I always say that the, also the problem is that we've lost the, the role even of the priest. So now in America, one of the, m m many of my close friends are priests. One of the priests I grew up with, he was telling me, he said, Donna, some people call me. Again, this idea that the priest has to do everything. I received a phone call from one, one person from the church saying, Abuna, I need help buying a car. And I said, Abuna, what did you do? And he said, I went. I said, where did you go? That's not your function. If you, you know, if you are, good, like, you went to haggle and you were having experience, that fine, go. But the point of that phone call was to say, I don't know what choice to make. So every choice and decision, I have to go to Abuna. Again, I am not saying, do not have a spiritual father. I'm not saying, do not go for guidance. This is not what I'm saying. But I'm saying, we have crippled our function and our ability to make decisions as a body, as a church, as someone who's been part of the creation and knowing that I have to live and I also have the Holy Spirit to make as, as subtle decisions as buying a car. And so I've, I've made Abuna to function as my little puppet to make my decisions in everything that I do. And that's problematic, one, because you the priest, poor priest. And two, that's not the function of the priest. The function of the priest is to guide, to direct, to loose and to forgive, and to implement liturgical services. And, to be a and so now I, as a layperson, have lost our ability to function. I know I'm giving you an example of the part, but the, the problem is I cannot function as my role within the church. I cannot function in what is what is God's will in my life. I have to make every decision based on what I have done. And so this also puts a, a, a pressure on the clergy. I remember one of the bishops was visiting New York recently and he said, and I didn't think of it this way, but not clergy. But he said, with that mentality, you're putting the clergy in a corner. And that the clergy has to have an interest for everything. So there's a lot of issues with how we we use, utilize the roles of the clergy, how we understand, again, the role of the lay person in the church, and how we honor the gift of the Holy Spirit in And again, I'm not saying that we, we need no direction. I'm not saying the other experience. I'm saying that we also have been given the Holy Spirit. And if we believe, again, going back to discerning what is the role, male or female, that I believe the Holy Spirit is in through the guidance of the church, through the life of the church, the Holy Spirit will guide me to this truth, through the guidance of my father confession, through my spiritual mentors. And so we need to actualize and make this real. The Holy Spirit is very much alive in me and in you, as is everyone else, as is the priest, as is the Pope. And if we don't, then we are loosening and we're lessening our potential as baptized Christians in the church. I'm not fulfilling my potential, again, to that standard. And I believe that the church needs to make, we need more people to take 
action of their roles. Again, this union and diversity. I'm seeing how I'm doing on time. I'm almost. Um, and in that understanding, again, for the church to realize that the, the role of the lay person is so very much vital and essential as it is for the, the clergy. And again, we will slowly find, I believe, we slowly find the gender gap that we bring into the church will lessen and dissipate eventually over time. Because every person is fulfilling that role the Spirit has given. And if we're functioning all together in harmony, as the scriptures teach us, we're all working in unity and diversity, that, that we will reach the ideal of male and female. Whether we, re we reach it in this life or not, but this is what we need to progress. There has to be a progression. If there's no progression, there's regression. And so, practical steps. I don't know if I'm asking, okay, Donna, be practical. I've been very theoretical in times in my academic training. I always believe to be informed is to be practical. And if I start understanding my understanding of gender and my faith and what the church really did and how the church really views gender, this in change will change my matrimony, my opinion, and the change of my mind. And in hopes, of course, to change my mind, change my beliefs, and change my actions. And so in orthodoxy, and this is the role against each person. And orthodoxy is a living dynamic faith, as Christina mentioned earlier. If the church is living today, it has to be a living expression of this truth. We call orthodoxy marrying with the praxia, the praxis, the praxis, the act, the practice of the truth. It can't just be theoretical, be speaking to saying all these doctrines, but unless we carry them out and execute them and make them real, then we will see how the church is supposed to. And in my opinion, I think, and you know, also said this as well, that this also promotes healthy discussion. I think, again, we need not fear discussion. There are certain things I think that are we question for the sake of question without wanting an answer. But I think if we promote the discussion, even without coming to the solution, that this will generate a more of an understanding, a more of an understanding of who we are again as Christians. Who is the church? Who is God? But sometimes, when we, especially when we talk about gender, there's a fear. There's an opposition. There's sort of a drop. Why? Because I believe sometimes we're living in that cultural fear. We're afraid of this foreign word called change, which the church is always changing. Not the drop, but the church is always changing in its practices and so forth. And, and if we continue to live in fear, then we're also again crippling the church. Because we're not based on fear, we're based on truth, based on revelation, we're based on Christ. It's not a, a place of fear, but a place of confidence in the doctrine, a confidence in the revelation. That we know this is our truth. You know, many of us that we're Coptic and we're proud and we're Orthodox. But if we're proud and we're confident, then why is there that predominant fear when we won't have this discussion? Not for the sake of reform, like I said, but to inform and to have this recognition of our personhood. To recognize that there are aspects of gender we need to be discussing in the 21st century for us, for our families, for our friends, for the sake and the advocate the church. And again, if the church is living and dynamic and there's no male or female, we need to subject ourselves to understanding that it is led by the Spirit and it is the living body of Christ. And I finish with one quote by a Greek Orthodox theologian of the 20th century. And he says, for our theology to be real, it has to give one. I think I went over time, but I apologize. Um, I do get passionate sometimes. Um, I can share this PowerPoint with any of you as well. I have no problem with that as well. Do you have any questions?
Okay. Well, thank you very much for that, Donna. Um, I believe now, for the balance of the time, we're going to have an opportunity for the people who are here to ply you with questions. I hope that's okay. Um, so what, we, what we've done is uh, we have a microphone up there on the side, and I think the camera, oh, the, the microphone's over here. Um, actually, come on, I'll hand over to um, Jessica to explain how we're going to do it, because I think she knows what we're doing. <laughs> so, it's a pretty basic uh, procedure if you have a question. Um, you formulate the question and then you say it. <laughs> um, but basically, um, Justina and I are um, here to take questions and pass them on to Donna. If, if Donna can't hear them, we'll try and make sure we get the question to you. So, um, we'll open it up. Um, again, this is a very, very broad topic um, and, and, it, and conversation could go anywhere. You can also go over to the other microphone as well. Um, <clears throat> so, if we can't answer the, topic, the question today, we'll definitely do our best in future to, um, to get the answers. Is that okay with you, Donna? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Hello, Donna. Thanks for the talk again. Um, I was just curious because a lot of what you said about um, gender in the church, it's um, the Trinity, the concept of the Trinity underpins it. Um, and yet, in other religious societies, you still see this, you know, um, distinction, gender uh, between male and female. So when it comes to secular societies, sort of like, I can be whatever I want to be, like that drop-down menu that you showed, where do you think mm -hmm. that comes from? Because it, surely it's not just because secular people do not believe in the Trinity or don't understand that it underpins gender and unity and diversity. So what do you think this is probably the result of or the product of? Did that make sense, kind of, or? So I think what I understood is how, how did we get so far? How did we come to these sort of um, labels or even if we believe in the Trinity or if some people still believe in the religious idea? I guess, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, how, how has it become so divorced from what we believed uh, to hold, like, you know, male and female, it seems pretty obvious to us. How did it, it's more, it's it less of a theological question, I guess, but, yeah. Yeah. From a society, society perspective, I mean, I mean, I'll speak from American culture. I mean, this is a good, this is my personal experience and personal opinion, um, without being a historian or anything, or an anthropologist, but, um, I think, again, it's this idea of that you be who you want to be and be expressive. And so, of course, throughout the 20th century, you have different movements. You have the feministic movement, you have the sexual revolution, you have all these other things. And so you have history intervening um, the way, of course, society and cultural views these things, right? And so if you have such a freedom of expression, where's your limit? And the way you express yourself oftentimes is the way you believe who you are, usually. And so if my belief of myself is transgender or what have you, or male, or all these things, I will express myself in certain ways. Um, how we've gotten this far, again, my opinion maybe is there was no limits. And that if you have no constraints, if you have no sort of um, go to place of what is your sort of your starting point of what is male and female, right? Because what does that mean? Anymore? You have so many layers to that, right? Because you say male is subject to culture, and what is a male, right? So I think that's why things have gotten so blurry and things have marred the line so quickly. Um, and so because especially the sexual revolution and the feministic movement, right? So now you have this sort of, again, these are very generalizations. I haven't gone in depth in studying this, but you have now a shift of women trying to fulfill men's roles in different ways and, and vice versa, right? And so there's kind of an unclear role of what male and female is, whatever that is in society. But even from an anthropological perspective, that's also getting mixed up. And so that's why you have these surgical procedures, these transgenders, and so forth. And so, again, if I don't understand my humanity as a human being, male and female, 
then I allow society and culture to define me. And that can go anywhere. I hope that sort of answers. Sam, can I get you to go up to the mic and uh, we'll zoom in on you so that... <coughs> yeah? <laughs> oh. Hi, can, can you hear me, Donna? Oh, yeah. I can hear you, yes. Yeah. Cool, cool. All right, so, um, so uh, hi. <laughs> so um, thank you so much for that. That was, yeah, there's a lot to think about. So I kind of have two questions, right? Um, so the first one is, so you presented a really beautiful picture of the way that in the church, male and female coexist. And so what I understood is that you're saying that in church, they become completely united, so there's no separation, but there is still a distinction, and you, you emphasize yes. the distinction a lot. Um, so I just wanna think that like a potential problem with that view is that the scriptural language in the New Testament seems to almost go beyond even the distinction, so it's not just equality. I mean, when you, when you talk about neither male nor female, that language sounds quite strong. He seems, to, I mean, you could read that, you can make an argument where it seems to be saying that the distinction as well as the inequality and the conflict and the separation is um, abolished. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. how might you respond to that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, what I always like to say, again, we look at forces, you know, we look at scripture as a whole. So if I know and I believe that Christ still honors my personhood, and I don't dissolve in his divinity, for example, from a theological perspective. Meaning, when I'm baptized, I put on Christ, this person of Christ. And so all of a sudden, magic happens, and there's no male and female. There's, a, there's no, obviously, a physical reality to that, right? And so even in that, if I believe, if I take that from a little literal perspective, that there's no male and female, then I also say that I'm negating my ontological reality as human being. Christ also doesn't honor my gender that he created. And the church doesn't honor it as well. And so, but the idea of what St. Paul is saying, that there's no separation, right? There's no male or female. There's no Jew or Greek. And all are one in Christ. And so again, when I walk through the doors of the church, I'm not dissolved. Again, when I'm baptized, I'm not dissolved with divinity, right? I maintain my humanity. God honors my personhood, my creation, while I put on the divinity in baptism, right? I put on Christ. And so again, in putting on Christ, I'm not dissolved. No. Mm. Okay, no, that's, that's great, yeah. And that actually fits really well. You mentioned briefly about the emphasis on the body and the importance of the body, and that even persists yeah. to heaven, right? So that's, okay, no, that's good. Um, all right, and so my second question, um, this, this I'm, I'm just sort of trying to think of what we can say about Christ and his relationship to gender, right? So you also emphasize, which I really liked, the way that uh, Christ's, Christ makes all of us properly human, right? And part of our humanity is our gender. Um, yeah. And then you talked a bit about Christ being a male when he was on the earth, and we're sort of saying yeah. that he's not. So could you push that even further, if you wanted to be provocative, um, and say that there's a sense in which Christ also contains womanhood in the sense that a woman finds her true womanhood on this view by becoming one with Christ. Doesn't that imply in a sense that womanhood is in Christ, part of what Christ is, the content, so to speak, of his humanity is actually womanhood? Right. Because if we can right. say that, that's really interesting. It's, it's quite yeah. provocative, but it's, it's very interesting. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I think this is where we just have to be very, very careful. Um, if I'm being recorded, that's fine because I will <laughs> remember what I'm saying. <laughs> the microphones might so stop working. In just sense, <laughs> okay, cool. So, in a sense, yes, let's, let's go from back to the basics. So, yes, Christ is God. Christ has taken flesh, but Christ is also male, right? So that's, I would say, that second phrase, maleness. But in him, right, like St. Paul calls him the final Adam. Some languages, some uh, translations, he's the second Adam. But in Christ taking the first Adam, the f Adam is above creation, right? In Adam is male and female, right? Mm. So because when when Adam saw Eve, he saw himself. Right. That's what yeah. he said. That and she's in his rib. Life. She is exactly. She yeah. literally is part of. It. So if everyone is in Adam, how much more is everyone in Christ, the Creator? Yeah. 
And so when we look to Christ, woman, man, male, you know, everyone looks to him as the human, right? And so even a male, when they look to Christ, they don't, yeah, I look at Christ for my gender. Um, that'd be a little bit weird. <laughs> so um, maybe in some ways fine, but, um, but in the sense that I look to Christ as a woman, he's my creator and that he created me and he's human. And I see myself from an anthropological perspective. But again, I, don't, I can't use the language saying he's female. That's why I say we have to be very careful with the language yeah. we use. Um, because he wasn't. He was, yeah, he yeah. was human. But in him, as the mystery of humanity, he took all of humanity in himself. This is him as redeemed. And this is by right of creation to everyone as the second, the final Adam. Great, thank you. Thanks so much. Great, thank you. Uh, hi, Donna. Uh, thanks for the lovely talk. Um, I just wanted you to elaborate on how gender, in the church at least, is a divine construct. How do we make that gender construction in the church? Does scripture define our gender roles? Most of uh, scripture is written like history or like a mm. narrative. Or you have descriptions of people, and as you noted, uh, Jesus had to break down taboos and social mores um, in his day. And most of that is just recorded passively in the Bible. So how do we make a divine construct? What, how God has uh, believed what male and female mm. is? Oh, mm, thank you. Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, as I said, I think there, there, well, there is, there is a mystery to what is gender at the end. You know, is it merely a bodily function? What is it? And I think when it comes to the church, yes, we could say, of course, there are clear descriptions in scripture of what is the role um, of a man, you could say, again, towards the priesthood, for example. Um, but in the divine construct, again, if we look especially at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, among many, many other parts of the New Testament, that the spirit is given to all, right? There's no gender discrimination or gender description, I should say, description in First Corinthians 12, right? But then you say, ah, Donna, he talks about apostles and apostles are male, right? They said, no, this is our, again, our lack of understanding that in many of these roles in the early church, especially, that both men and uh, women fulfilled, again, I'm putting aside priesthood, and so women were apostles, teachers, administrators, all these things that he lists, they're prophets, right? So if we look at the scripture closely, men and women shared all these different roles. And so if you want to say, what is God ordain a specific role? No. And this is why I say, in a sense that we, our responsibility, the gift that we have as baptized Christians, that we have the Holy Spirit, we need to discover along our spiritual journey, what is this role? Because if it is a divine construct, and if it is ordained by God, that means, again, that he's leading, and it's the Holy Spirit that's giving the gift and leading the way. Um, and this is, this is why I think it's just so beautiful in the early church that you see it much clearer that the women, there are women who are prophets, there are women who are apostles, there are women who are teachers. Because, again, we tend to focus just a lot of the history, what we know about of the male. But they're very much both very alive and diverse in the church. And of course you have the deaconesses and their functionality. Again, deaconesses is not the clergy. Um, so in that sense you have the living dynamic reality of the church and the charisma of the Holy Spirit in the function of the New Testament clearly in the church. I hope that answers. Yeah, thank you. Um, and the Another question would be, uh, how in the church do you envisage today that we can inform the congregation to empower uh, more equal or equal participation among the females in our church? Thanks. It's always a golden question. <laughs> um, am I being recorded, by the way? I'm just curious. <laughs> 
We are trying to get an answer on that. Yes, okay. I, think, I think yes. <laughs> okay. okay, that's fine. <laughs> so, um, I mean, there's, there's many ways and there's many angles we could answer that. Um, but the way I envision it, you know, again, this is my personal opinion. I know clergy disagree with me. <laughs> so, um, of course, we can't be radical and we can't be controversial for the sake of being controversial. This is not what Christmas is. But the way I feel, one, first part of the question is how do we have more inform the congregation? At the end of the day, I, I, I believe, again, it's our respect of our personhood. And if I truly respect my personhood, male or female, and I honor that as a gift and being made an image of the Trinity, I like the gospel says, love your neighbor as yourself. I, we reflect how we love ourselves, the other, and likewise we receive that love from God. It's Trinitarian. And so if I have that genuine love, authentic love and respect for my personhood, I'll likewise have that respect for the, the person of the other, regardless of gender. And so I always see the spiritual masters of speaking people that there's no, you know, it, it doesn't really need to be taught. It needs to be lived and a living expression. So this is why I said that quote that if we have the belief or the act that's different towards male and female that reflects our belief in God and reflects on ourselves, I believe. So maybe that's a way I believe we teach or this has to be kind of a a complete transformation from within ourselves, honoring humanity at the end of the day. And if I honor humanity, I will, regardless of male or female, there will be no discrimination. That's my personal belief. What I envision for the church, there's many things we could do according to the region, according to the need. Of course, with the need, um, nothing's cookie cutter. But of course, leaving not the doctrine is the doctrine of the church. But what I envision, of course, you know, you could do things like, for a woman at least, if you could say, have the woman participate more. I know some churches, the states, they have choirs now, a uh, choir leader for women, and they have a sort of a dress. Again, they're not ordained. I think, again, that fear of culture. Oh my gosh, they're going to ordain as priests. No, <laughs> there's, no, there's a function for them. They're just singing. Um, so I think that adds more uh, of a face value and an inner value as well to the function and the recognition of women in the church. So again, so people will say, oh, well, the, the church honors me, the church values me, I have a function. And that's, that's one aspect. Um, again, the language that we use is very important. It's the language, like I said, language is very important. Um, I also envision um, that as subtle as these things may be, but even in the walls of our church, Look at the icons. Um, actually, a friend of mine who's been studies, PhD, her, PhD woman, she's Catholic. She did a questionnaire. And this is what we do. How many Coptic women think around the walls of our church? Does that say something? This is again. This is my opinion. Um, This might be radical for some, but I will say anyway. Um, I think we also add women to the coming of the saints, the liturgy. This is my, again, opinion. I know people completely disagree for many, many reasons. That's fine. Um, it's not doctrine, it's fine. Um, and in that, in those, again, those subtle things that we're doing is not for the sake of change, it's for the sake of a movement or sake of a revolution for the sake of honor and the sake of recognition. And I think that's powerful. And if we just settle as it on add women saints to the congregation, right? They're part of our tradition, they're part of our life, they're part of our body. The hearing as a woman, a fellow woman's name, I could I could connect with her. I could feel that there's again a recognition. This is my opinion, these are my views. Um Again, I think we there's there's some movements I would love to see that we see the, the movement of spiritual mothers. I know in some tradition it's more poignant. Um, in some Greek churches, for example, the priest's wife usually they call her presbytera, presbyter, the mother of the church. 
Um, she's sometimes the spiritual advisor for the woman and the young girls. She doesn't give, of course, absolution in confessions. That's not her role. But she's the mother and the guide that women connect to more than they might feel more comfortable with the priest. Again, not negating confession. That's not the point. But to get that direction and that connection. Some priests have told me, um, Donna, how do I, how do I, I can connect with a teenage girl when she's going through? So in that sense, again, the edification of the church and the benefit of the church, we need certain roles to be um, emphasized and to be kind of recognized um, for the, that kind of idea we're, we're reaching to. Those are some thoughts. I won't go on, but this is uh, thank you. And I might just shuffle over and ask a question as well. Um, Donnie, you just touched on some points in answering that last question um, that I probably would like to expand on a little bit. And I think um, it's very interesting that when we spoke about the diversity of gifts in the church, that's something really to be celebrated. And um, we know from you know, fields of psychology that there are real differences in the, in the general abilities of, of men and women. And, and it seems like psychology is the only place where we like to talk about those things. You know, we like to say, well, men don't have to turn a street directory upside down and 55% you know, of men can do it, you know, whatever it is. Um, and you know, women uh, have better language skills or whatever. And we really like to emphasize these these skills and abilities, and then we sort of say, well, diverse workplaces, you know, are better because then we've got these mix of abilities and whatnot. Um, and I guess if that, I mean, that is sort of one specific field. I, I also, I worked in engineering companies and, and you know, being 90 percent or more male, you kind of tend to pretend like you're one of the boys and you think maybe I shouldn't wear coloured nail polish or something because you know, that, won't, that won't go down well. And you know, you pretend like you have no problem getting into that disgusting pit because everyone else is getting in and that's what you do. So um, in all other elements of society, we try and pretend like we're all the same. Um, and I guess if we do that in the church, what is it that we're missing out on? Um, and you mentioned this idea of spiritual mothers and it just kind of really touched something in terms of, I was recently at church, you know, pretended like everything was fine and one of the um, more senior servants pulled me aside and said, what's wrong? And I said, oh, you know, I'm having trouble at work, you know, whatever. And she listened very patiently. Um, and then she said, no, really, what's wrong? And, you know, I had probably seen a Buna that day, I had seen you know, all kinds of people. And um, women have this ability to get into people's lives in a way that maybe um, men possibly don't, you know. What is it that we're missing out on, I suppose, um, by, by all pretending like we're, we're the same and not sort of celebrating the diversity of gifts that we have? Mm, yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think you, you hit a lot of that already in your question. And I think, I mean, I know personally, I'll say is, um, I mean, I'll, I'll focus on the motherhood, for example. I think for women, again, and men as well, we connect, you know, in certain ways we connect differently and maybe women are more, again, these are general statements. I don't like to make so many general statements because they're shared among both genders, right? But you know, if you take the concept from men are from Mars, women are from Venus, and then women like to talk about things, and women like to connect about things and get to the nitty gritty things. But you could sense that there's a certain gift um, that women can connect to in certain respects. They like to talk about things, where maybe guys might not in a different way. And so we are missing out if I, let's say if I go to, if I grew up in a church um, and I had great mentors and I had great male figures, um, but sometimes, no matter what I think, as a woman, you still need that motherhood, that connection. Um, and if we don't use, at the end of the day, male or female, like I was saying, if we believe that the Spirit is giving everyone a gift, in the beyond comprehensibility of what that is, the diversity of gifts, and the multitude of people we have in the church, 
and when not everyone is carrying that gift, we're definitely lacking something, right? So, I mean, think of it that maybe, I mean, I don't know if this is the best example, but think about, you know, take one radical saint from our tradition out. Take St. Anthony out. How would the church be different today? Yeah. Take Pope Polis out. He's like, God forbid, and other thing. But how would the church look different today? And so how many of what, of course, we're called also to sainthood, right? So we're also lacking. That's why we're short of the bar. And so even if in those sense of, of the saints that are very much part of our lives and our tradition, how much in the day-to-day -day aspect of my experience that I have with the community? You know, I know a lot of times on a, on a basic note, but we choose our churches based on how comfortable we are, how we connect with people, or how welcome people are, or our friends, all these things. And so if we don't feel welcome, we don't feel loved, we don't feel that there's a function, we don't feel that there's a mentor, there's something they're lacking. And that's what I'm saying, we all contribute to each, with each other. My sin becomes your sin, my righteousness becomes your righteousness. I benefit from the saints from their righteousness. I didn't do anything. I didn't pray like Pope Carlos prayed, but I benefit from his life, his story, and his value has brought something to me. And so again, we have to, I think, emphasize that. And so even in our roles, we have to be, the idea again, being selfless, right, is being human, being Christian. And that, what is my role? And so the benefit for everyone, it's not about me. The church is not about me. We never say I, barely, the church, liturgically, in our language, we say we, us. We believe in God. We believe, we proclaim. So it's about us, this man. So if I take the responsibility in my account, my role for the edification of everyone, things will, I think, radically change. But sometimes it's all about me world. Um, I hope that kind of answers them. I actually want to say one thing as well with the spiritual mother. I know there's one particular, I have two spiritual mothers, but one particular woman in Egypt, uh, she's quite known, um, but she's a mother to so many people. And because of her, you know, I think, especially as women, are able to connect and to have that guidance. Um, you know, and I, I'm able to go and have a retreat with her, you know, um, as a mother. So I think I'm so grateful for her and her pursuit of holiness. I didn't do anything. But because of her holiness and her pursuit of her calling, I, I benefit. So I think, it's, I think that says plenty of the power of how it affects and that what is our role in our the church. Okay, um, can I chime in and ask a question? Uh, I don't know if you can see me, but this is a woman. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Oh, hello. I, I loved everything you were saying, by the way, Donna. Um, the reality is in the Coptic church today, and probably in a lot of um, more traditional churches, we're not alone, is that many people would look at the issue of women in the church or gender in the church and say, why are you trying to change things? We've been okay for the last 2,000 years. Um, if you then sort of try and enter into a sensible dialogue about it, generally um, those same people will say, but the Bible says, you know, wives submit to your husbands, uh, I do not permit a woman to speak in the church. And basically they'll find a biblical justification for maintaining what I think most of us today here would agree is more of a social kind of um, habit. Yeah. Who's to say who's right is my question. Okay, on the one side people are saying the Bible says, on the other side, okay, today your, your talk was very biblically based and very, um, you know, based on the fathers. Are we kind of doomed to a kind of relativism where there is no truth and it's just people's opinions? Or is there actually an objective truth about this question? And how do we go about finding it and bringing the two different groups of people together in a constructive sort of way? Hmm. If you have that answer, <laughs> we will be way ahead of ourselves. Um, no, it's a great question. Um, 
I think, I mean, again, these are my, my opinions. I think, unfortunately, some, some aspects in some discussions, whatever tradition, in any form of religion, I think that people will not be willing to have dialogue. Um, and that's one, one perspective. And I think in that sense, it takes wisdom to know whether it's worth having the dialogue with certain people. Whether, you know, like you said, like, there's nothing real okay, nothing. With people who are, we can have dialogue with or discussion within the church and so forth. Um, I think, it, again, it, it, it's, the ideal, again, is being submissive to the Holy Spirit. Where is the Holy Spirit leading the church today in the 21st century? If the Orthodox Church is alive, one priest said, it's not an ancient church, it's a living church, right? Based on the truth of Christ, based on the, on the spreading of the of preaching of the, the apostles. And so, if I have this belief that the church is built on the teachings of Christ, but yet living in the 21st century, we have to be wise and prayerful and be open to the work of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Okay, again, I know it's very kind of broad and big. But if we see, for example, needs, I think the key is to knowing the needs of the church. We say, oh, the church has been fine for 2,000 years. Why, why stir up commotion? Why, you know, why riffle up? Why bring up some waves? Well, again, for the sake of controversy, we don't, this is not our aim is write things to create controversy, to create problems. We write things or to talk about things to inform and to discuss, to have a good health discussion. Because there will be needs that we're addressing today that might not be relevant in 200 years. And there will be needs in 200 years that need to be discussed. And so it's the, it's the wisdom of us as lay people and as likewise as clergy to be receptive to those changes. So in our post-feministic revolution world, yes, we'll have those questions that we'll never ask why women cannot be pre. And whether we want to answer or not, fine. But or we should be discussing it. We shouldn't be shutting it down because if we're shutting it down, then there's an underlying uh, aspect of fear there. This is what I was saying for fear. And so if we're confident again in our faith and we believe that this is our faith, I think we need to be open and wise in how to discern, okay, what did the Father say in this sense? The Father didn't say everything, of course, right? Because they didn't deal with everything that we're dealing with now. Um, but I think it's up to us to be educated and to be informed in our faith to build that foundation. And be able to say, okay, well, do I believe in bioethics? Do I believe in having a surrogate mother? Or do I believe in, in what have you, stem cell research? All these things in my faith-based knowledge and experience. And going back to scripture, but also going back to our tradition and the history of the church, right? Um, apply that to my 21st century. I have to meet the needs of people if the needs of people now in the first century think, what is the role of the woman in the church? We need to answer that question. Because it's not about me, myself, and I. It's about us. And if the church is asking that, we need to address it. You know, sometimes, like you said, we're behind. You know, basic things of the Coptic church, we don't respond to political statements. You know, whatever that might be, we're not there as political activists, but we need to respond to certain issues that will affect the church. Same-sex marriage. So we need to have a strong response to those things, not out of fear, but out of understanding. I hope that helps. And it's, uh, there's always, I think there's always uh, change needing to be happened, but for the sake of the needs, not for the sake of the need. Okay, well, thanks. I think we're drawing towards the end of the session. Um, so I'm just going to stand up. Excuse my back, Donna. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just going to look at the people. Actually, I can look at you too. Um, I'd, I'd like to, uh, on behalf of everyone who's here, offer a very heartfelt and warm thanks to you for your martyr-like sacrifice today <laughs> of getting up so early in the morning. I don't know what that's going to do to your Sunday liturgy attendance, but... Uh, the, the, the blame is on us. <laughs> no, uh, it's all right. Thank you for having we, me. No, we've, we've really appreciated it. It's been very thought-provoking. It's been wonderful um, to hear those ideas. The only thing that makes me a little bit sad is that I'm going to have to close down Abuna's car buyer consultation service uh, <laughs> at our parish, which I kind of enjoyed. But 
Um, maybe, it'll, maybe, maybe it'll give me more time to do other things. Um, thank you so much. And thank you also to Justina and Jessica and Justina um, for the, uh, who put in actually quite a lot of research work and preparation for today and worked with Donna, uh, which we really appreciate as well. And all of our IT team who miraculously got us through tonight with very, well, a few problems, but very, very few. So thank you for that. Um, we're going to pray shortly. I just want to briefly mention to you that our next meeting is going to be next month on the 12th of March. And we're going to be discussing community and individualism. So, in, you know, whether do we, in society today, there is this tension between everybody's an individual, everybody is like the individual is the most important thing, individual liberty, individual freedoms, that kind of came up a little bit today. Uh, but then you have this other principle, which is, no, we're actually a group. Um, as Donna was saying, in the Mass, we usually say, we do stuff. So how does the Christian look at that tension in the modern world between being an individual and being part of a larger community? What does it mean for us um, as Christians? Uh, so that will be our next meeting, 12th of March. Uh, we look forward to that. Uh, all that remains, I believe, is to remind you of the snacks. Unfortunately, Donna, we wish we could share the snacks with you as well, but we won't be able Thank to. Thank you. Oh, okay. Apparently, we're going to take a picture. So apparently, all you have to do is, if we have someone with a camera, um, we're going to get you just to look around, so that way we get Donna in the picture as well. Um, okay. Very high tech. So yes, the the cameraman is slowly moving to yeah. If you, yeah, thank you. Yes, come come forward if you're not in the picture, so you can be in the picture. Okay. Everyone smile for the cameras. There we go. Well, I think this is another first, by the way. You brought us many firsts today, Don. I don't think we've ever taken a picture of this <laughs> meeting in like six years that we've been running it. Oh. Well. And, and you actually get to be in the picture, I think, at least two times, because there's two screens, so that, that, that's very clever. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you all. Uh, if, uh, please feel free to grab a snack at the back of the church and hang, hang around and continue some of the discussions that, uh, on some of the points that were raised today. Uh, if we can please all stand for a final prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Hear us, our Lord, as we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. For thine is the kingdom, power, and glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you all. Have a good night or a good morning, as the case may be. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.